Welcome everybody, this video is your introduction to classes and object-oriented programming in C++. This is designed to be your crash course, the essentials to get you started. If you want all the excruciating details, then I have an upcoming C++ course and I'll have a link to get notified when that comes out. That'll get you on my newsletter, which is the number one way I share all my new stuff coming out. Now, before we get started, I wanted to give a special thank you to the sponsor of this video, which is Into the AM, which provides these graphic tees. This is one of many glorious graphic tees. Here, let me show you the back. Get out of the way, dog. So if you like this style, then you will love Into the AM. I'll leave a link and a coupon code down below. So to start off, we are going to create a class. Now, if you're brand new to this, you might be like, oh, what the heck is a class? So before we start writing that class, we're going to go through an example of why you might want this thing called a class and how you would use one. So to start off in our code, what we're going to do is we're going to create two strings. So I'm going to say include string and we will create a first name and a last name. So standard string first is going to be Caleb and then standard string last is going to be curry and then you might have some function to print the full name and that could take those values and put it on the console you might need to pass those in or something like that so you can see we have a first name a last name and some function that are all related to a specific person caleb curry and then we want to print their full name so in the context of object-oriented programming this would be an example of what an object could be useful for well, a class is how you describe the structure for these objects. So instead of having a specific name like Caleb and Curry, you're just going to keep it general and just say first name and last name. And then you can create an object from that class. So if we wanted this code to work, what we would do is we would come up here and create a person class. And it's going to look like this. End it with a semicolon there. And you're going to use the public keyword in here. And here's where you define any of the attributes you want a person to have, such as first, and then another string, last. And you can see these match what we call these variables down here. We could also define the function as well, print full name. And what will this function do? It's just going to output the first name, a space, and the last name, and then an end line. Now we're almost there. We created what a structure of a person looks like, but how do we actually say that this code down here belongs to a specific person? Well, we create a person by putting the type, in this case, person, capital P, giving it a name or an identifier. That's how we create a person. And then instead of creating new variables, we could say P dot first and P dot last, and then finally, P dot print full name. And you can see we don't have any errors. We should be able to run this code and we get the output Caleb Curry. So we've just created the most basic class and object. So this is the class, it describes the structure, and this is an object that is a specific instance of that class. So to go over some of the vocabulary real quick, class, this describes the structure. The object is a specific example of that structure, often called an instance, which is the next word I'm going to use here. So an instance, another name for object, and then actually creating that object is called instantiating. Now we can have data members, which are variables that are defined inside of the class. So we'll just say variables. And then we can have methods, which are functions defined inside of the class. So we'll just say functions. So these are the words you should familiarize yourself with so far. Just go ahead and pause the video, write these down, memorize them. I forgot to put a definition here, creating an object from a class. Now, once you have these down, you should understand that you can use the class, which is just a general structure to make multiple people. At least that's the case for here where we're creating a class person, but you could create a class for anything. In our situation, we have a class person, so we can create multiple people down here. So another example would be person P2. P2.first is Simon. And P2.last, I don't know, says. I know that's not a name, but whatever. P2.print full name. When we execute this code, we should now get Caleb Curry and then Simon says. At this point, we've added this class, but it doesn't really make our code a lot more simpler. We just made more code. So it doesn't add much value yet. 
but we have the basic structure and we can continue to expand on it to make an even better class. So right now we're just learning the principles. It might seem like we're just creating bloated code by adding all these classes and stuff, but when you have a, a more complex system, having these classes is going to be essential because that's how you're going to organize all your code. So now that we have the basics, a class and an object, we can start talking about the main pillars of object-oriented programming. These are abstraction, which is more of a concept in my opinion, but then we also have encapsulation, inheritance, and polymorphism. All of these last three are kind of like examples of abstractions. So without getting too technical on the wording, sometimes I'll just consider there to be three main pillars of object-oriented programming, encapsulation, inheritance, and polymorphism. Let's go ahead and write these out in the comments here. So we have abstraction. This is a concept where you make something easy by hiding the complicated stuff. And the other pillars are what I consider some more practical examples. So these you can have concrete examples of, whereas an abstraction is more of a concept. So encapsulation is granting access to private data only through controlled public interfaces. Bunch of words to basically say we're going to gate access to the data in our class. The next one is inheritance, inheritance, which I always have a hard time spelling for some reason. And with this, we can create derived classes or children classes that inherit properties from their parent classes. Next up, we have polymorphism. And this is where we can treat multiple different objects as their base object type, which we'll see what each one of these means in more detail now. So let's start with the first practical example, which is encapsulation. At first, it's going to look like we're just adding a bunch of code without providing much value, but this is an important principle to understand. What we will do is we'll separate these public things down here, and anything defined here is going to be private, implicitly, meaning you don't actually have to type private. However, you can type private, and that's okay. So you might see private, and what we'll do is we'll take the first and last name, and move these to the private section. So our new structure is we have a private first and last name and a public print full name. So we're talking about encapsulation now. We're basically granting access to private data only through controlled public interfaces. And the term interfaces basically just means the way you work with the class. So in this case, it's through this print full name method. Now when you do this, how do you actually set the first and last name? Because you can see here, we're getting a problem where these are inaccessible because they're private. We can no longer just access them directly to assign them values. So what we can do is we can create a setter or what some people will call a mutator, but I just prefer the term setter. And this will look like void set first name. This is going to be a method. So what it will need is a string. So we can say standard string first name. And what the code will actually do is assign first name to first. So it'll look something like this. You can have the parameter be the same name as the actual data member, but if that's the case, you have to do one extra thing. So if this is called first, this isn't going to work. You actually have to prefix it with this. So it'll look like this here. And you can see that works as well. And we're going to do something very similar for the last name. So set first name and set last name. Change the parameter here from first to last and we're going to assign to the last data member using that last parameter. So now, instead of assigning these with an assignment, you're going to use a function call or a method call. Set first name, passing in a value, Caleb. Similarly, for the last name, we'll do the same thing. So p dot set last name, passing in curry. We'll do something very similar for the second person down here. So we'll just say p2 dot set first name passing in simon and p2 dot set last name passing in says great so this should work exactly the same way the only thing we did is we added more code but we should still get caleb curry and simon says in the output so that was an example of a setter you can also create a getter which will get data 
and this is going to actually return the string instead of printing it. So we could say get name, and we could say return first plus a space plus last. This is a little bit different than print full name, which puts it out to the console. This is going to return the string so you can do whatever you want with it. And this also shows some value of encapsulation because we can customize what you can get and set. In this situation, you can only get the full name. You can't get first and last name. You might want to make that functionality, but for demonstration purposes, we're going to keep the individual data members private and only allow them to get the full name. So we actually are able to add a little bit of functionality to control how data is accessed. So you could down here now say p dot get name and that's going to return a string which again I'm just going to output it so it's going to look pretty much the same so standard c out and then standard end line this is a method so we'll need those parentheses and hit run and you can see it does get our name and prints it out to the console you don't have to do c out so if you had for example a function that took a string you could pass in p dot get name and that would return the string value to pass to the next function Next thing I wanted to talk about is what's known as a constructor. This is sort of like a method, except its specific purpose is to instantiate objects from your class. Additionally, it has to have the exact name as your class. So it's going to look like this. No return type, and it's called person, the same as our class. This is typically going to take some data passed in, such as a string first and a string last. And we can assign those to the data members with a colon and saying first first, passing in the first parameter to the first data member, and then additionally passing in to last last, and then curly braces. So that is a certain syntax for constructors that you'll often see. This is called a constructor initialization list. It's one way of creating constructors. You can also do a classic constructor, which you might be more comfortable with. That's going to look like this. I'll just write it down below, where you're still going to take the parameters. So standard string first, standard string last. And inside of here, you're going to manually assign to first the first parameter and manually assign to last the last parameter. So this is a little bit more what you might be used to for functions. However, this is a common syntax in C++ and I think is generally recommended. So we're going to go with that. But just so you know what is actually happening, it's basically this code here. So we'll remove that one. Now we have a constructor. And what this will do is it'll allow us to pass in the data to the person initially, so we could say Caleb and Curry, and now we don't have to invoke the set first name and set last name individually. When you do create a constructor like that, it's going to remove the ability to create a person without setting that information. So in this case, you can see we're getting an error because we're not passing in the first name and last name. So if you want to basically force the user of your class to initialize the data, you would just create a custom constructor and not create a default constructor. So let's go ahead and pass in Simon and says, and then we will remove these two lines here. If you want that default constructor to be still available, all you have to do is say person parentheses and assign it default. That's basically how you can say, hey, I still want you to be able to not pass in data when instantiating a person. So in theory, we should be able to now pass in nothing. So let's say person P3, and we shouldn't get a compilation error. Looks good. So if you want to do that, that is up to you. Just know that at this point, the first and last name are not properly initialized. All right, at this point, we have a pretty good understanding of encapsulation and constructors. Now I want to talk about that next pillar, which is inheritance. This is used when you want to create a new class, but take most of the information from another class. You can think of this as basically being a derived class or a child class. In our situation, we have a person class, which can be the parent class, and we might have an employee class, which is the child class or the derived class. So I've been throwing a lot of words around, so let's write that down in our comments so we can see that. So we have the parent class or what's known as the base class. This is inherited from 
And then we have the child class or the derived class. And this is, uh, I don't know what it'd be, inherited to, the one that does the inheriting. So let's go ahead and make a concrete example of this. Let's say we wanted to create a new class. We'll say class employee. And this employee is going to inherit from person. So to do that, you're going to use a colon and say person. And as simple as that, you're going to have a new class that's going to automatically have some features from the person class. So let's go ahead and instead of creating a third person here, we're going to create an employee and we'll just call him E. Now we can say E dot and see that we have things already available to us. So for example, we could set the first name of our employee and I got to remember this is a method. So we have to pass in data like so and then E dot set last name Curry. So now Caleb Curry is an employee. Now you'll see two problems here where set first name and set last name are inaccessible. The reason for this has to do with the way inheritance works and when you inherit from person all of the public stuff becomes private. So a quick fix for this is to say public right where we are inheriting from person. Now we no longer have any problems and we should be able to set the first name and the last name of the employee as well as saying e dot print full name. So we're going to have all this code and just for clarity's sake, I'm going to remove our old code. So now we just have a single employee and we can see that we get Caleb Curry in the output. So now, even though our employee class is essentially empty, we still have all of this functionality that we got through inheritance. So we can create derived classes that inherit properties from their parent classes. So you might be wondering, okay, we had a person class and now we created an employee class that does exactly the same thing. What was the point of that? Well, we can actually add stuff to this new derived class that is specific to an employee. You know, maybe they have a department they work in. Let's go ahead and define that behavior as well as create a constructor to initialize these employees. So inside of the employee class, we can have a private section to have the employee's department. So we'll define that as a string department. And then we will also have a public section to create a constructor for this employee. So we'll call that employee. This is going to take a string first name, a string last name, and a string for the department. Now here's the thing, for the first name and last name, those are defined up here in this person. So what we need to do is we actually need to invoke this line of code, the constructor for the person, passing in the first and last name. So the way you do that is you first create the colon and then say person passing in first name and last name. And then we can assign directly to the employee, so the department, by saying department, passing in department. So it's going to look something like this. And we can also create a method to get data. So if we wanted to get the department, as well as set the department, we could do that here. So let's return a string and call this get department. And what this will do is just return department. Let's create the setter too. So this one's going to be void, set department, taking in a string, standard string department, and what this code will do is assign it to this department is department. So that should be the code for a getter and setter. And I'll just save and do a quick reformatting. It looks a little bit different, but all the same. Let's test some of this out. So we create an employee and we can pass in the first name and last name like so. And we can also put the department, we'll say sales. We should still be able to say e dot print full name, but if we want to actually get the department, we might need to do that manually because the print full name doesn't touch the department. So we'll just say e dot get department and then create a new line. Running this and you can see we get first, last and sales. Let's go ahead and create a method to actually print the full name and the department. That'll just keep everything organized and get us some more practice creating methods. So inside of employee, we can create a new function and we can just call this print info. It will be void because it's just going to print to the console, print info. And we'll just create some information here. So we'll say name and that's going to be in, in quotes. And then we'll just output, pr uh, not print full name, but get full name. 
and then we will do an end line and let's check for get full name it's just get name so that was just a typo on, on my part so get name now that works and additionally we're going to have another line in here standard C out department and for this you should be able to use department directly since it's defined in this class here and then an end line save make sure it's all clean and then down here instead of doing both of these lines we could just say e dot print info running this and we get name is first last department is sales so we just created a method that is exclusive to an employee. It doesn't happen or exist inside a person. Now I wanna talk about two important keywords which are protected and override. So let's talk about protected first. So if we wanted to access the first name and last name directly in the employee, see how we did name, we had to use get name, but if we didn't wanna do this and actually get first name separately, we actually can't do that. And that's because they were defined as private. So if we say first name and then try to do first for the first name, it's not going to work. You can see we get an error and it says is inaccessible. So if we want it to be still kind of private to where you can't access it directly inside of like your main code, for example, but you still want derived classes to be able to access that data, you can change the access modifier for first and last by changing private to protected. And now we can access first name directly if we wish. So we could change the get name call if we wanted to first and last name. So standard C out, last name and access last. So that's pretty cool. So protected is a pretty important word to understand. So now we can access first name, last name and the department. The next is override, which is a little bit different. What this is going to do is it's going to allow us to have something in the base class and then change it in the derived class. So there's gonna be two versions. So in this situation, we are printing the first, last, and department, but what if we wanted something very similar in the base class? So we could define that up here. Well, in this situation, it doesn't really make sense to have the department because department doesn't exist on person. It only exists on an employee. So we could just remove this line here. Now, this is actually still going to work. So we've essentially overrid the print info from the base class. You should be able to use either one depending on the type of the data. So if you have a person P and this person has a name, so first name and last name, or let's go with my actual name here, we should be able to say P dot print info and these are going to invoke the appropriate version so the first one's going to be the first and last name the next one's going to be the first last name and department so we've essentially overrid that data but if you want to be explicit you can say override here which one specifically is this going to override well it's going to be the method that we label virtual so that's basically how you can tell the compiler that these are associated so if you later go ahead and change something like let's say instead of saying print info you change this to output info well it's going to complain because now you have a, a mismatch in the name output info and print info so this will basically just protect your code a little bit better so that way we are always forced to use the exact same name and we're being sure that this print info is overriding this print info. So basically it's a way to be very clear of your intentions. So I would recommend using override and virtual when appropriate. Virtual means, hey, if necessary, the derived class can override this. However, I don't think it's required, so I think we can remove this. But if they want to, they can, and they can be clear of their intentions using the override keyword. This is the perfect segue to the next important pillar of object-oriented programming, which is polymorphism. This is a concept where you can basically treat multiple different types as the same thing, and they will act appropriately based on their implementation. That's a little abstract and hard to make concrete, so we'll go through an example. But in this situation, we have a print info for an employee, and we have a print info for a person. So these are both able to print info about themselves, 
So we can just basically say, hey, everybody print their info and each one is going to do the appropriate thing. There's another common example you'll see on the internet with animals, for example. You might have an animal base class and then you have like a dog, a cat, and a monkey. And then you tell all of the animals to speak. Well, the dog is going to bark, the cat's going to meow, and the monkey's going to ooh, ooh, ah, ah, whatever that's called. So that is an example of polymorphism. In our situation, we'll just have the employees say their department and we'll have the people not say their department. So let's go down here and we will actually show an example of this where we could create a vector of the base type. So we'll say standard vector. And I think we're going to have to import this or include this. So vector and this is going to be of type person and we'll call it people. And then what we'll do is let's get rid of these print info calls. We're just going to go down here and say people dot push back passing in P and we'll do people dot push back passing in E. So in this situation, we're adding both a person and an employee to a person vector, but because it's the base class, this makes sense because an employee is a person. Now we can create a for loop for person, person lowercase, coming from the people vector. We will invoke person dot print info. Now when you run this, you'll notice that the employee version is not actually being executed. To fix this, we can make a small change across our code, which is going to bring pointers into this, which I know some of you are not probably comfortable with. I do have a dedicated video on pointers, which will get you up to speed. What we're going to do is basically just take a vector of person pointers and pushing in the addresses of these two objects. And now we just need to change the type in the loop from person to auto. And because we are working with pointers, you can use the arrow on person to get print info. Now when we execute this, we should get the appropriate response depending on what type is being invoked. This will work even if you had multiple derived classes, as long as they all ultimately inherit from person. Last thing I wanted to talk about in this video is static methods, which are methods that are related to a person, but not an individual person specifically. So you can think of it just kind of like a library of functions that are somehow related to a person. Those are a good example of when you might want to use the static keyword. An example would be if we wanted to extract this functionality to print the people, we could have that as a static function. So let's go up to person and inside a public, we will have static void print people. And this will actually take the vector. So a vector of type people pointer, which is what we had to find below. And we'll just, oh, it wasn't people, sorry. It was person, person, and we'll call that people. And then we'll go ahead and copy and paste the code from down here, right here. And we'll take that and paste it here. And then down here to invoke that method, we can just say person colon colon, and then we'll have this print people static method where we can pass in our vector called people. Running this, and you can see we get the same exact output, but now this print people function can be invoked multiple times if we wanted. So let's say we were, you know, making changes and we just wanted to check the status of it, we could just print it whenever we needed. And it's associated with the person class, so it's organized, but it doesn't have to be invoked on an instance because it's not tied to a specific person. So you're not invoking it on P or E, you're invoking it through the person class using the two colons. So that is your introduction to static methods. There is a ton more that we could study, and this was fast. This was designed to give you the essentials as quickly as possible. However, if you need a lot more depth, then I encourage you to stay tuned for my upcoming C++ course. This is going to go through all of this information in a lot more depth and slow enough that you can really absorb the information. I highly recommend this if you're a beginner and you want to take your skills up to intermediate or advanced. In that course, we're going to go through all the explanations of understanding things like the const keyword or understanding the pointers and everything in between. 
So definitely stay tuned for that. Check out the newsletter link if you want to be notified when that comes out. If you've stuck through this video, clearly you're interested in that type of material. So I think it'll be great for you. Thank you. I'll see you in the next one. Peace out.